Um, so anyway, I was sort of inspired to do this because for the past couple of years, I've been working a sort of form of community of people of color in public media. Um, I think a lot of people feel very isolated at their stations, especially if they're one of only a handful of people of color, or maybe the only person of pe person of color at their station. So I had been connecting with a lot of people, starting to form communities. And then um, I think when the country erupted around this conversation again for the umpteenth time in June, I was very inspired by the Philadelphia Inquirer journalists of color that staged a sick out um, over the headline Buildings Matter 2. That actually led to a formal apology from the Inquirer and a senior editor retiring. And I thought that was really inspiring. So I started reaching out to people of color I knew in the space that were interested in doing some things. And I ran this idea of doing a sick out for everyone of color and public media by them. Um, we ended up forming a coalition with eight people of color from different stations, different markets, different formats um, throughout the country, including some music stations. And they really fleshed that out and they took it and they ran with it. They came up with a lot of ways for people to participate besides calling out sick if that was not available to them and think making it a lot more inclusive, as well as 11 DEI action items for organizations to commit to doing on a specific three-year timeline. Um, we're kicking things off today with the, today is our day of action and education. We're calling for a lot of people to take action today. And I know a lot of people are, I think even some people on this one call already have plans to participate today. Um, but that's really just the beginning. Uh, this is sort of our inaugural kickoff party uh, for what's gonna continue to be a lot of work in this space. Um, in addition to following up with organizations to make sure that they're following their commitments that have signed up to participate, um, we're doing some coalition building with other people who are doing organizing, not just in this space, but tangential spaces, sort of like this group, um, you know, media, nonprofits, journalism generally, not just public media. As we know, um, this is something that's affecting a lot of aspects of media and entertainment and journalism and not just uh, public media. So that's sort of my five second pitch about what's going on. Um, for, so, I mean, your, your group is a collective of all sorts of different stations, news stations, music stations. Um, what, what are, I mean, what are the things that we should be kind of like thinking about as far as like most of our most of the stuff that we've been focusing on focusing on is you know based on music stations what like what we can do within the sphere this is where we work but i'm curious like because so much of the conversation i feel like in this world has been focused around news stations are there things that we should be thinking about that maybe we're not you know other than you know, I sent you our kind of like our action items and kind of the stuff that we're focusing on, but I'm curious to get your kind of feedback on if there are little things which we should be thinking about or, you know, moving on. Yeah, I think one of the reasons we formed this was that a lot of the organiz organizing that was happening in this space was specifically around newsrooms. And, you know, I applaud a lot of the SAG after unionization movement, but it's not accessible to everyone. A lot of the people mm -hmm. in our organizing committee work in fundraising. So they're not eligible for that union. Um, you know, a lot of smaller stations that don't have newsrooms aren't eligible necessarily for that union. A lot of music stations have found it found it very hard to unionize with SAG-AFTRA. So um, we're, this is a direct response to the fact that so much of the movement is, has been around the newsroom specifically, that this is going to be a broader thing. And if yeah. you look at the action items on our website, they're accessible to every station of every size. It doesn't matter if you're a community station or, or a college station or a AAA station or a classical station. Those are things that should be accessible to you. Um, and if not to the exact letter, at least the spirit of it. Because I think it's so important to bake this into the fabric of everything we do. And I think maybe the corollary conversation I hear a lot with news stations is we'll just diversify our music library and we'll add tags to our music library so we can track exactly how many women and people of color we're playing and we'll set some sort of quotia and, and like that's like very upsetting to certain people. Um, and the reality is I don't know how much change you get for that amount of work. That is a tremendous amount of work to overhaul your music library for stations where most of you don't actually have to play anything from your music library if you don't want to. <laughs> um, 
And I would really say that instead we need to turn inward. Our outward product, what we are broadcasting outward is never really going to have a true spirit of equity and inclusion unless we take a look at our internal house and do some housekeeping first. And if your stations are run on secrecy and hierarchy and tradition, it doesn't matter what you're broadcasting outward. It, a house is rotting from within. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel like that's, that's been like, the one thing I really like about the way that you guys broke things down is up until now, it's felt like, because so many of our organizations are smaller, either like whether they're labels, whether they're promotions companies, whether they're like a smaller staff station, the stuff that the, the ideas that people are putting out there are all very solid. You're like, yes, but how do I implement this? How do I scale this so that it makes sense to me? So I think you're right on in, in that, like the first thing people go to is like, oh, let's look at the library. Let's, let, let's kind of balance the playlist. Let's do this. But what we, what we have been talking about a lot in our group is kind of like, okay, like how do we actually encourage the comp encourage a conversation what kind of tools can we provide to people to connect more directly with their communities to be talking about what's happening locally how do we how do we actually connect with our our listeners and become more active and aware kind of like servants of that community um, yeah yeah i think that's the most important thing you can be doing and i know a lot of stations um in feeling the pressure from music streaming services are sort of doubling down on like more music, more music, less interruptions. Um, but that is sort of trying to copy a model that will never be. You know, what makes public media and music stations particularly unique is the ability for a DJ to give context to a song that you would never hear on Spotify. I would truly like to see more storytelling and more context from DJs. And I think people need to start thinking of themselves as music journalists and not DJs. Um, that was something that kind of really surprised me coming from, well, so I originally, I originally started in the music industry. I worked at some uh, independent labels. I worked at a number of venues. I started putting on punk rock shows when I was like 15. And when I switched to public media, I was working at a news station. And so when I came to WXPN, I was like, this is going to be the best of both worlds. I'm going to have public media and I get to return to the music industry. And I had a lot of culture shock and disillusionment. And um, I, yeah, I think one of the things that shocked me, I say that because one of the things that shocked me is that all of these people that were constantly writing commentary about albums and concerts, all of these people that were playing music and giving like deep historical context on what they were playing did not see themselves as music journalists. They saw themselves as DJs. And I think that does a disservice to the depth and skill of your on-air content staff. Um, but also when you start to rethink of yourself as a music journalist, that is when you start providing a unique service that is not available on any music streaming platform. Yeah, I think that there's the, like what you're talking about with context and being able to like give a, give a deeper dive, respond in the moment. Like there's all these elements which we, there's not even really a comparison and we see now the way that community is responding to local radio that like that they're looking for exactly that they're looking for a connection they're looking to be a part of something and like we've seen with the stations that are leaning into these um leaning into doing more editorial like that that the response that they're getting has been like crazy it's been you know their fun drives have been better there i mean i think that like i think that switching the or flipping the switch and thinking about what you're doing as a journalist versus a DJ makes it makes a huge difference because that's exactly I mean not only is there more accountability there but also there's a different sense of duty to the listener it's not just filling space um so I mean I guess you I mean you move from XPN to OPB you're still at a music station what what are the things like you know in your perfect world like what comes out of today like what do you see and i mean maybe what do you see specifically from music stations or for many stations but specifically for music stations if you can think of anything that that kind of that turns that turns a corner after after this summer after today 
Yeah, um, I'm still the so KMHD is part of OPB. I'm still getting up to speed on their amazing work. Oh, Rob Hathaway work. Um, I've been listening to. I've actually been listening to them a lot lately, um, and I'm getting like very good jazz education. But um, if if people aren't already aware, one of the things that's interesting about that station is that even though it's a jazz station, their prime demographics are actually like 35 to 55, maybe even younger. Um, Morgan might know if she wants to put it in the chat. <laughs> um, and it's so young because they have really um, not treated anything as canon and they have not kept anything static. And one of the biggest fears I have for AAA stations, and that's obviously where I have the most experience, is that this continued doubling down on rock and roll as four white dudes with guitars is killing the genre. Um, there is no future there. And it's, um, I really think that if we keep on running our AAA stations that way, AAA will go the way that most classical and jazz stations have gone before it. And, you know, it's not that there isn't new classical music or new jazz music being played. It's that most of those stations are not playing that because they are sticking to a canon and that staticness is keeping their audience static and just getting older and older and older. So I really hope that we don't fall into that trap. Um, I'd really encourage people to think outside of the box, which is like cliche, um, <laughs> and, and be brave and have these conversations internally. If, if your on-air staff is almost entirely white or entirely white, and it, it's not going to be enough to just play more black artists, that seems like blackwashing to me and is also not going, to, because the decision makers are all still white. I'm a little rambling here. If people no. also have more specific questions, I'm happy to answer. Yeah, if, anybody, if anybody has questions, you know, pop pop into the chat for sure. Um, but no, I mean, these are a lot of the things that we've been talking about, and it's truly, really, it's kind of like it. It this sentiment echoes exactly what we have been kind of seeing going on in with the election. Is like we're we can't program to the audience of 2005 or 2000. We need to be program programming to the audience and the people that we want to be speaking to now. Um, so it's it's getting people to wrap their heads around the importance of making that change, which I think has been difficult for a lot of folks. Uh, and it is hard. It's a hard thing to communicate, and it's 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 scary to think about making that change and letting go um, for the and for the you know for the the stations that we deal with that are tied to universities and stuff there's another layer of like of red tape and communication and you know trying to figure out how to navigate you know making those changes in that world um, but yeah I think that like everybody kind of needs to start thinking about who we want our audience to be, who, who we're truly talking to. It's not the same audience as it was, as what, you know, people may have in their head as, you know, who were the, the core of the format before. So, yeah, I mean, if any, does anybody else have any questions for Sachi? Because she's got to hop off in probably five minutes to host the webinar after this. But if anybody else has any, um, has anything they want to bring up. Um, I, of course, uh, am looking for some like, what do we do after today? Um, <laughs> if we want to go there while people are popping in. Um, anything that, I mean, besides continuing the conversation, Sachi, anything else that we should be thinking about going into the end of the year? Um, well, we have a ton of resources on our website, publicmediaforall.com. I'd encourage you to check it out. If your station wants to sign up um, and commit to doing our DEI action items, we're more than welcome to welcome any size station. Um, we specifically partnered with the National Federation of Community Broadcasters from the get-go because we wanted to make this accessible to stations of all sizes. Um, and I think the other thing I would say, since I know many of the people on here are from programming land and I am from fundraising land, um, I hear a lot of programmers say that they get pushback um, that they that they don't want to upset their donors, and as what <laughs> coming from fundraising okay. land, I have never 
ever heard that or experienced that. I don't know where this narrative comes from that we're keeping things the same to keep donors happy. I know a lot of donors that wish that we would diversify even more. And I actually think in the long run, this is a better play for the financial stability of stations as well. It's not just about doing the right thing to be more diverse. Like the financial future of our stations relies on this. Millennials donate a larger portion of their income than boomers. So far that in total dollars, that is technically less, but that's gonna change real quickly as the great wealth transfer happens AKA boomers die. Um, and I, just to be totally blunt and my apologies to any boomers who may be offended by that, um, but it's happening. And people of color tend to actually donate a larger portion of their income. So playing to a younger, more diverse audience in the long run is a better fundraising strategy. And I'm sure the underwriters on here will chime in that there's plenty of people who wanna underwrite for a younger audience as well. So I, I don't know where this narrative is coming from that we yes. can't innovate because of donors, but I would really like to dispel that myth. Yeah. Right, I do have a question. Great. Yeah. Message. Yeah. Did you get joined? Uh, oh, sounds like a child got a question too. I, I, I wish I had Carrie's cell phone. That's happened in the past. Well, I just yeah. messaged her too. Um, yeah, she don't know a little about that mute button. Check it out. <laughs> I got a question that uh, I want to get a general answer from you, more so from uh, your own perspective, because I, I love to hear people's off the cuff type responses. I, um, I'm a programming director for University of Richmond's uh, station of hip hop, uh, director for programming at WDCE 90.1 FM. And certainly, the, um, are we still here? I don't see the big K. Sorry. There we go. Yo, so peep game. My thing is this, is, um, a lot of times, I think that many other people who work for different sort of stations or broadcasting fees would also agree that when you go ahead and present to uh, anybody in leadership, the idea of perhaps altering programming to feature people of color more so, what their number one backlash go-to answer is that, well, we are a quote unquote rock station. And um, the connotation behind we are a rock station more so is gonna be like, yo, well, we're gonna exclude a major aspect of what music is. And also you know, our station is branded towards being geared to this, uh, this one, this one genre, which is majority, a majority of it is going to be white. And thus the program is immediately less inclusive. I was wondering what your general answer would be in a situation if you were hit with that sort of uh, pushback and trying to make, you know, broadcast entities more inclusive in the programming. Um, I've had that conversation before. It's incredibly frustrating. I mean, my gut response, and I'll be honest, I didn't say this in that moment is that's racist. Um, it's also, this is actually, so this is what I said when I had that conversation. I was like, are you seriously, we just did <laughs> a retrospective on how rock and roll is based in gospel music. Are you really telling me that rock and roll is white people music? And um, the person I was having the conversation with got extremely frustrated or flustered, I would say. It didn't go very well. I'm not sure I'd recommend that, but that is what I said when um, I was given that almost that verbatim, it's like you read my mind and my experiences. Mm. Um, again, I, I think a couple things. I, the, the premise of Public Media for All is a belief that there's a handful of station leaders who are already doing this work and we can learn from them. There's a handful of station leaders that are never going to get on board and we're not wasting any more energy on them. Good riddance, have fun, ride that horse off into the sunset. Um, and the, the vast majority of stations want to do something, but they see this as like a nice to have kumbaya thing and, and or they don't know how to move forward and they keep putting it on the back burner. So we're talking to the middle. We're talking to the stations that think this is something they need to do, but don't know how to prioritize it, don't know how to move forward. That's what our resources are geared towards. Um, you know, I think in terms of station leaders like that, I would really challenge them that it, like, you know, if you want to become a classic state, classic rock station, have at it. You're going to get a majority white male, older white male audience. It's going to be hard to fundraise with them. And you're going to be in direct competition with um, iHeartRadio. Yeah. Um, and I'm sorry to hear you're experiencing that. Oh, I mean, it's one of those things where I do not feel like consuming and, and digesting a person. And so 
I let them live. And then with COVID happening, their life has been spared for now. But <laughs> I was uh, curious what you, were, what you were thinking because you know, that's, that's something that exists, I think, in, across the board in lots of programming areas. It's like, ultimately, we're geared towards such and such and we, see, we receive records from service entities, such and such. And our auto programming when people aren't present is geared towards this and that because it's our general audience. And they, uh, they just make up metrics and different sorts of things that they feel the justification when um, you know, there's, no, there's no other consideration of it. And they don't realize, quote unquote, that uh, most of that generally creates a certain sort of bias and marginalizes the audience. But I will I, eat them alive when the time comes, I promise you. <laughs> I mean, also find other people to band together. I think, you know, uh, once you get out of your silo, especially if you're at a salt, smaller station, once you get out of your silo and start talking to other people in other departments, you may find a lot more allies than you realize. And if the entire station feels differently than station leadership, that has been the point at which we've seen a lot of uh, high profile departures recently. There's been a string of station leaders either retiring or being forced out. So. I mean, and I think this is the conversation that one, a lot of programmers are having with their, with their staff, their, you know, whether it's PD or who are GMs or whoever, but also it's, it's one, it, the, converse, the conversation about diversifying is specifically in non-commercial stations, college stations, community stations is one that, and you've been a part of it. We've been having a non-com and, and out, outside, of the, outside of that world for years and years and years. So hopefully, um, hopefully this, your organization and the amazing tools that you provide and this organization and everything else that pops up kind of in between, we can continue building and kind of figuring out how to work together and like amplify these messages, act on some of these, um, these great resources that, that people have put together um, and like really make moves this year. Because this, I, you know, and this is what I tell, and Sachi and I were talking about this just a little bit, you know, before this is like this year, people feel ready to make or hope that people want to make significant change. And it certainly seems like it's a part of the conversation in a way that it hasn't been before. Um, so that gives me some kind of ray of hope. I, I see Shil with one last question, if you're okay with it, Sachi. Um, how much consideration do public stations give to listener feedback? Whether, do you know, like, I know that you're on the underwriting side, but like when you're getting feedback from like, whether it's like, you know, listeners, donors, whoever, We've had, you know, in our in our last, actually in our um, workshop that we did with the non-convention, we had people from KEXP who have been, you know, um, very transparent about the changes they made, say that they have gotten, they had one of the best fun drives of their entire careers. They got amazing listener feedback. How much, how much can the listener actually influence the programmer in your experience? You know, I think it depends on the station. Um, I think some stations don't listen to listener feedback because they think it's not representative. And I think there's a fair case for that. But then I would also offer if, if you're not getting other sources of data, then that's all you have to go on and better to go on that than nothing. Um, I think some stations give a lot of credence to it. I unfortunately think a lot of stations though pick and choose what listeners they wanna to listen to and they hand pick out the feedback that supports their views and they keep themselves in their fun little echo chamber. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I'm going to um, make sure, obviously we, we have all of Sachi's um, like paper, the uh, tools and assets and I'll repost all the links that her organization has provided for us. I'm going to agree or encourage everybody to dial into their webinar, which is happening in, you know, 10 minutes um, and just say, thank you so much. I hope you'll come on again and you should, yeah, definitely. it would be awesome if you could, you know, we would love to hear outcomes from your guys's event. Um, and, and also just like to check back in with you and like, you know, I'll, I, I told, um, Sachi, I would keep her updated on the stuff that we're working on, but like, I think like the more we can figure out how to work together and kind of like amplify each other's messages, like the, the more, the more reach we've got. 
Awesome. Yeah. And I just want to shout out, we've had a couple of music stations sign up to participate. Obviously, KMHD is participating as part of OPB, but uh, KUTX in Austin is also signed up, as well as the classical station in Kansas City. So we warmly welcome more music stations joining us. Um, well, hopefully we can keep like building, you know, and connecting the dots here. And yeah, really looking forward to hearing all the stuff that you guys are, you know, going to present in the coming hour. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sachi. Um, so if you guys haven't already, if you guys need a link to the, to the webinar, let me know. I think you can still sign up on the Eventbrite thingy. Um, there's a link on our, on our agenda. I just registered um, so you can. So great, cool. Um, and yeah, I mean, again, we still have a ton of work to do. We have a lot of exciting things that we're working on all together. If your station is doing interesting editorial programming and you feel comfortable sharing it with the group, if you see somebody doing something interesting that you want us to reach out and chase down, like let's do it, let's keep building on it. Um, I will say thank you very much to everybody on the call who's, who's done a heavy lift. Tariq, I don't know if you're still on here, but this man, super hustling with uh, Boney Bear and all the crew in Wisconsin. Don't think we didn't notice. Um, that was amazing. Um, also, everybody in Georgia, Shill, I know you've been doing a ton of work on the ground, um, but just everybody, I, I just can't stress this enough. Every little bit, every nudge, every just reminding somebody, every connection, it really, like we're seeing how much those little things matter right now. Um, so, you know, let's just not, let's keep our eye on the prize and, and, you know, stay focused and, um, and we'll meet back here next week with, uh, well, by then we'll have all the stuff, the fair fight and, um, Georgia post sorted, but we are of course looking for content on like what's coming up. Isaac's fleshing out kind of our strategy for the next till the holiday. So start thinking about it, keep thinking about it. And like, let's keep building on, on messaging and stuff, go, like carrying us through till the end of the year. All right, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end a little bit early so everybody has the time to like gather the chi and get ready for the webinar if they're doing that. Thanks for joining everybody. And yeah, we'll see you guys next week, okay? Bye. Thank all. you. Thank you.